Hi folks, it's Dr. P. The purpose of this video is to get you acquainted with the oscilloscope. The oscilloscope is a very useful tool when we want to measure voltage properties of time varying signals. We already know how to use the multimeter to measure DC properties. The oscilloscope is going to be used to measure AC properties. It's capable of measuring voltage and showing it with respect to time. I'd like to point out the uh, probe that is used for the oscilloscope. Firstly, has a BNC connector with kind of a plastic shielded uh, edge. So make sure that you do not interchange this with the function generator probes. They usually have little yellow bands around them. The probe itself has two ends and they are not interchangeable. One of the ends is the high potential end, and this, if you press down on this little plastic spot, you'll see a little probe comes out. And the alligator end, which is the other end, this is the ground or the reference potential. Okay, and then uh, keep in mind that this thing actually does have an earth ground inside. So you wanna make sure that if you're using this with a function generator, that this end actually does go to ground. They must share the same ground. Otherwise, bad things will happen. Magic blue smoke will come out of components. Okay, so that's that's the edges of the uh, leads we want to use. I'm going to uh, go ahead and turn on the oscilloscope. So the button's on the top. If you press the button and nothing happens, odds are good that this thing is not plugged in. The power cable is on the side. Sometimes it takes a little bit for it to warm up and start. If it takes a long time, just have patience. So what we can do is we can just kind of start by putting this on a calibration signal, and then eventually I'll connect it to the function generator, and then I'll connect it to an external circuit. So this is a really awesome feature of an oscilloscope. Sometimes you might be wondering, wow, the oscilloscope's giving me weird data. I wonder if there's something wrong with my probe, or maybe there's something wrong with the oscilloscope, or is there something wrong with my circuit? So what you can do is you could take that positive lead and stick it on the bottom right. There's a little spot that says one kilohertz on top. And then you take the bottom, the ground lead and stick it on the ground. And if we hit auto, this will kind of automatically measure that signal. Okay, and what we should notice is that we're seeing a frequency of one kilohertz. So this is a nice calibration. It's basically telling me, hey, this probe works, this oscilloscope works. If I wasn't measuring a good signal before, it's because my circuit, it's not good. So it's a nice, uh, it's a nice little smell test that we can use. So I'm gonna connect it to the function generator for now. So we can get a feel for just kind of how to use the basic features of the oscilloscope. So the, I gotta say, one thing I really like about this oscilloscope is it does a pretty good job in auto mode. So I'm just pressing the big blue auto button and it does a, it does a reasonably good job um, just automatically catching the, uh, triggering and, and, and catching these, these pulses. So I have it on square wave mode right now on the, uh, on the function generator. I wanna point out that a lot of students are tempted to just always press this auto, auto, auto button. And it does a good job if your circuit is connected properly and your function generator and oscilloscope are connected to the correct spots. If your, um, if your oscilloscope is connected to something that is just going to be basically giving you a noise signal this thing will show you an amplified noise signal. So you should always have in mind what you expect to see on the oscilloscope. And if you do not see that, then you should be wary of what the scope is showing you. So how can we kind of smell test what we're seeing on the screen? So the two things I wanna point out are the uh, bottom left and the center readings. So the bottom left tells me for this channel one, which is the only channel I have anything connected to right now, 
how many volts per division. So if we see there are these little white dashed line, this says that there's one volt per division. So this is telling me this signal has an amplitude of one to almost three volts. Okay, so this is about 2.8, I'd guess, if I had to, if I had to pick a number, 2.8 volts, something like that. So if that makes sense, then, uh, then I know that that's good. But if that's telling me maybe the voltage per division is very, very small, that would be something I would want to know because perhaps if it's just a couple millivolts that what I'm looking at is just noise if I expect my signal output to really have a couple of volts, for example, amplitude. The next thing to look at is this M. It says 100 microseconds, and that's telling me what the time division is here. So this has just over 100 microseconds of a period, and that kind of makes sense considering that right now this thing has a frequency of four kilohertz, just over four kilohertz. So again, we should have some idea of what our signal should look like so that when we press the auto button, if we see something that doesn't live up to those expectations, we can be aware of that. There are a couple things that we can do as far as changing the look of the signal on the screen as soon as we press that auto button. So we can change the number of volts per division by dialing this knob to the left or the right. So if I dial it to the right, it's going to decrease the number of volts per division to the point where this thing will actually go off the, off the screen. And then to the left, it increases the number of volts per division. Okay, so more zoomed out, more zoomed in. Similarly, this horizontal knob will either decrease or increase the amount of time per division. So zoom in, zoom out. If we have two different uh, signals on the screen, I only have one at, at the moment, but this thing is a two channel scope, so I could have another signal here. I could use this button to change the vertical division of the second signal, which would come out pink. Finally, we can change the offset voltage wise by dialing this small knob to the left or right. I usually like to have the zero volt part of my signal zeroed, in which case we can press that button. So it's a knob and it's a button. So if you press that button, then you will get that nice zero. So what I like to do when I'm comparing two signals together, I like to make sure that they're both zeroed by pressing both of these buttons. And then I like to make sure that they both have the same number of volts per division. If I'm very zoomed in on one signal and very zoomed out on another, then I'm not really able to adequately compare them. So I like to make sure that I've got the same number of volts per division. Let's take a look at the different menus. So there's a lot of menus here and we will not be using all of them. The first menus you can use correspond to uh, the signal that we're looking at. So again, we're only using this first channel here. So if we press this button and we can see uh, that there's a bunch of different uh, pages that we can look at. Uh, you'll notice here that there's one that says probe 1x, and I, I forgot to point it out, but the probe itself actually does have a little slider on it. One of them says 1x, and on the other side it says 10x. We want to make sure it's in the 1x mode, and we want to make sure that this is in 1x mode here, so these guys should agree. 10x is if we're measuring really, really small signals, which we will not be doing. There's a next page. You can press the bottom button to page through. Um, really, probably the only thing in this class that we'll be using is this filter button. So this thing is enable us to do a low pass filter or a high pass filter, uh, essentially if we wanted to filter out some noise. So we'll, we'll probably use that at least once uh, in the class so you know how to reach it. If I want to get rid of the menu, I just press the menu on off button. One thing I'd like to note, if you do press this button and this light turns off, then what you have done is you have basically turned off that signal, um, you just press it again. So if you're like, oh no, where did my signal go? Just press the button again, it'll come back. Math mode is not something that I've used, but um, it's kind of cool right now. It's not really gonna do anything useful because what it usually does is it, you can add, subtract, multiply, or divide the two channels together. So if I wanted to add the two signals or multiply the two signals, or I could also do uh, an FFT, we can do that in the math mode. So we do add, uh, subtract, multiply, divide, FFT, 
we can choose the sources uh, and so on and so forth. So I am not going to use that. Uh, and then if I'm like, oh crap, how do I get rid of that weird math thing? I just press the math button away again, it goes away. Cursors are a very useful thing. So by default, they are off. There are three different modes. The two modes that we can use are, are that we will use are manual or track. And in fact, track mode, I would say is the most useful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to a sinusoid because I think it's going to be more useful for showing the track mode. Um, and then when we get to one of these submenus, we can either press this button again to cycle through, or we can use this knob to cycle through. So it doesn't really matter which one you choose. So I'm going to pick on track mode. Here we can choose uh, which channel each cursor is going to. So because I only have things in channel one, we're going to use just channel one. But if I wanted to measure the phase difference between an input and an output, I could change, uh, let's say, one of the cursors to be in channel one and the other one to be on channel two. I'm going to activate cursor A, uh, and then I'm going to use this knob to kind of drag this thing around. And what you can see is that this cursor actually sweeps along the signal. So if there's a certain point of the signal that I'm interested in, I can kind of land my cursor there. I'm going to go to the next cursor and Sometimes it's off the screen. So sometimes it can kind of be tricky to find it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sweep it until it's in the next uh, position. So these guys are kind of aligned more or less in the voltage direction. And what you see is the top shows me the position and the voltage of cursor A. The second spot shows me the position and the voltage of cursor B. Then I can see the delta T. So this is the period of the wave because I've chosen um, equal points on the wave. And then I can see one over delta T, that is the, uh, that's the frequency. And then if there's a difference in voltage, let's say I wanted to calculate the, if I just wanted to measure the amplitude of this wave, what I could do is I could bring one of these to the peak. And then I'd bring cursor A to the equilibrium position. And I can see delta V is 2.68 volts, right, roughly. So we can get uh, information about the amplitude of this wave. So this track feature is very useful, especially when we're measuring the phase of otherwise noisy signals that the automatic measurement doesn't do a very good job with. Or if we're measuring like an RC time constant, and we know we want to measure that e to the negative 1 voltage position. If we know what that voltage is, we can put a cursor there. We could put the other cursor at the peak and then we can calculate what tau is equal to. So these cursors are really, really great. Manual mode is basically just enabling you to use only voltage or only current, so it doesn't sweep along the signal. So it's not necessarily not useful, but it's not quite as robust as using the track mode. And then I have not used auto mode, but I, I read the user manual and I know that in theory you could use it to like excuse me, automatically measure the peak to peak or something like that. And I'm going to turn the cursors back off again and uh, just turn the menu off. So the cursors are really great, but sometimes we want to automatically measure some properties of our waves. So to do that, we can use the measure button. In fact, I already have a couple measurements up. So when we get to the measurement menu, uh, I'm actually going to clear everything so you can see kind of how it looks if you've got nothing going on here. We can measure things in voltage, time, delay. So again, we can choose the source. I only have things connected to channel one here. And if we press this, we can see peak-to-peak uh, -peak voltage, maximum, minimum, amplitude, top, base, average, mean, RMS, a whole bunch of different things. So I'd like to note that the amplitude here does not actually measure from equilibrium position. So if I wanted to know uh, the, the actual amplitude, I would want to put on Vmax. So once I select the object that I want, I can click on Add. And this shows me the maximum. And that kind of agrees with what I had just measured. Right? It says 2.68, which is what I had just measured using the cursor. So that makes me feel good. And perhaps I want to measure also the RMS value. So I'll put RMS on here too, right? 1.76 volts. Now there's a whole bunch of different things we can measure with voltage. When we're done, we hit return. And then there's things we can measure with time period, frequency, um, plus width, minus width. So I'll show you. Let's put on frequency. 
and let's put on plus width and let's see what that means. So this right now has a frequency of 4.16 kilohertz nominally, uh, which agrees with my function generator. So again, that makes me feel good. I'm gonna switch to a square wave and I'm actually gonna change the duty cycle. And what we should see is that plus width decreases and increases as the frequency stays more or less the same. Okay, so that's, we're just changing the duty cycle. So in case you're not sure what plus width is. It's changing, it's, it's showing us the duty cycle. So a lot of good stuff that we can have here if we wanna do automatic measurements. One last thing that we can do with the measurements is delay and we can do a phase measurement. So this is really useful if we wanna measure phase differences between an input and an output. However, the phase measurement is not always perfect, especially when we are measuring somewhat noisy or low amplitude signals. So sometimes it's easiest to go in and use the track cursors and find a uh, delta T and calculate a phase from that. Okay, but uh, this exists, but I just wanna let you know what the limitations are. So what I'd like to do now is connect this to an RC circuit so we can look at charging and discharging response. And what you might notice is that the oscilloscope isn't really doing much. So sometimes we can use the time scale and, and get a good feel for what's happening. Um, or we could press the auto button. So right now I have a frequency that's a little too high for us to get good feel for the RC time constant. Here we go, that's much better. So now I'm able to kind of give my signal a sufficient amount of time to charge fully and discharge fully. So what we can do is we can use the cursor on here, uh, that track cursor to calculate the RC time constant of this. However, you'll notice that this signal is changing. So usually what I like to do here is to kind of capture the signal and get a single version of it and kind of like latch onto that and, and save it. Unfortunately, uh, you know, we're not really doing a great job of it just, just like this, right? So what we can use is this triggering menu. So if we press triggering, we can choose which channel, the slope. So let's say we want to calculate the discharging response. I would select this. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to get, uh, I'd like to just get a single DK and I'd like it to just latch on that and stay there. I don't know why it's deciding to put channel two in here as well. So what happened is I put in that, I want a de uh, falling edge and I want, uh, I want a single trigger. What it does is it gets, as soon as it passes a threshold, as soon as that voltage decays past a certain threshold and that threshold is set by this level here, um, here it's at zero volts. What it does is it takes that signal and it freezes it on the screen. So now what I can do is I can go into these cursors and I can go into track mode, right? And now I can select my peak and then I can take my other cursor and put it to my, uh, you know, E to the minus one, Oop, change the voltage per division there. I can put it to my E to the minus one spot and I can measure my RC time constant. So this triggering menu is very useful for us to be able to get a single snapshot, which enables us then to play around with our cursors and get good measurements without having to kind of constantly chase the refresh on the screen. So whether we want a rising edge or a falling edge, that's very useful. Now, let's say I'm done. Uh, I'm all done with this. I want to turn my cursors off and I want to see my signal again. We can just hit that single button again and it goes back to uh, regular mode. So we can hit single and it'll again it'll wait until it collects through that triggering um here it took a little while because if you look my my frequency is just half a hertz so it takes a couple seconds before it's going to find that threshold uh, condition and it shows it again and we can tell that it stopped because this is red and it has a stop uh indication on the top of the screen and whenever we're ready we just hit that single button again and uh, we can go. Now, if I didn't want to have to go through that triggering process, what I could just do is wait until my signal's there and hit the stop button. But uh, one possible 
repercussion of that is if I if I don't get it at the right time, I might not have enough of a of a decay signal to really look at. So we want to be we want to be careful when we just hit that run stop. Sometimes it's better to really use that triggering men menu instead. So that's really all I have to say about the oscilloscope. It's a pretty forgiving piece of equipment as long as you don't short anything out. So um, if you're not really sure what something does, just kind of go into the menus and click around and, and see what happens. Otherwise, uh, you're going to be making use of this in a lot of the labs. It's going to become familiar. Uh, don't be too scared of it. It's a really, really great tool. All right, folks, until next time, stay well.